Good afternoon, good evening, good afternoon. and good morning. Depending on where you're joining this webinar, welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for the past five years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures and movie screenings. LMU is also among the 15 schools in the country who was awarded the prestigious cyber grants from the U.S. Department of Education. The LMU Center for International Business Education serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. Today, our webinar will cover a very important and timely topic, which has great implications not only for countries in Asia and Europe, but also for the rest of the world. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 has made energy prices soaring, eroding the purchasing power of consumers and threatening to unleash an energy crisis that leaves manufacturers and households short of gas. As a result, European countries, they may not have enough energy to meet anticipated demand this coming winter. They might need to significantly reduce their use of natural gas in the industrial sector to keep households warm. A European energy shortage and could lead not only to economic turmoils, but also social tensions, but also to renewed calls for protectionism. Political economy and energy crunch keeps increasing recession risk as it will continue to raise inflation rate. In 2021, the EU imported 40% of its gas from Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin is deliberately using a strategy to weaken European support for Ukraine by weaponizing energy. However, I think this challenge could be an opportunity to achieve a more sustainable energy independence from Russia. In this context, we have invited three experts to educate us on the current state and future prospect of global energy. Let me introduce our moderator, as well as one of the speakers of this event, Dr. Anatoly Zublev, is my longtime colleague in management department. We spend 30 years together at LMU. Dr. Zupliff is a professor of international business and entrepreneurship. As one of our cyber area directors, he's currently a member of the World Trade Week Committee and the Global Initiatives Council of LA Area Chamber of Commerce. He has taught 30 years at LMU and at the Moscow Management Institute, where he received his PhD also in Bonn, Germany, in Warsaw, Poland, as a Fulbright Scholar as well as in uh, France and also at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. He has published numerous articles, books, book chapters in respectable international business journals. Anatoly, you can take it over now. Would you please introduce our panelists? I would like to introduce our panelists. I would like to begin with Dr. Ismail Arsiniegas Rueda. He is a senior economist professor of public policy, Pardee Rand Graduate School, and Rand is a think tank based in Los Angeles, California, close by. Professor Arsene Yegas Rueda is senior economist, and he held a leadership position in major energy companies in the industry, such as AES, PSEG, Constellation, and TransAlta. Uh, he maintains an active research agenda on real option and quantitative methods applied to energy and currency markets. He has several peer-reviewed publications in scientific journals. 
He served over seven, year, seven years on the Rogers Master of Quantitative Finance Board of Directors. He is teaching as an adjunct faculty at Catholic University where he covers energy economics and time series course. He also teaches at the Pardee Rand Graduate School on energy markets and climate risk. Interestingly, he worked at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, he is fluent in Spanish, French, and German. He holds PhD in economics from State University of New York at Albany. Uh, my good colleague and friend Robert Kapp is a founder of Los Angeles-based Geoeconomics, an independent creative source of insights into the forces moving global societies, markets, technologies, organizations, and government. Prior to establishing uh, Geoeconomics, a think tank, Robert served as a senior editor and chief economist of the corporate network in Hong Kong for the Economist Group. He previously authored two full-length books, beating on China and clusters of creativity. He was the chief representative in Asia for Marvel and was the English editor and translator of a best-selling Japanese manga biography of George Soros. He can perhaps explain what manga means for the greater audience. He has written a wide range of in-depth reports and participated in a variety of other things. Uh, recently, he joined uh, California State University in Long Beach as a lecturer teaching marketing. And his latest project is a clinical professor at Chapman University in Orange County, where he will be teaching and direct the newly created Asia Pacific Geoeconomic and Business Initiative. He is a graduate of Pomona College, where he was a Truman uh, Scholar and Watson Fellow. Uh, with a degree in Asian Studies. He earned his MBA degree from the University of Cambridge in Great Britain. Despite years of study in Britain and working at a British company, according to his own uh, description, he maintains a distinctively West Coast American accent. He is also fluently literate in Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and Japanese. With your permission, I will share our agenda. We plan to begin by having Professor Arsin Yegas to cover emerging trends in global energy sector. I will discuss uh, Russian energy sector, Russian history and current state. And Robert Kapp will discuss energy related implication for Asia, particularly in China, because China, India, and other countries play a critical role in this complex set of issues. Thank you. Ismail, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Anatolia. Uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to participate in this um, uh, panel, I have prepared some slides. Uh, I can share my screen um, to go over them. Um, can, I, can, can folks see the slides? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I uh, what I want to talk in, in this uh, discussion is about uh, the and the emerging trends in the emerging trends in the energy sector, uh, especially given what's going on in the um, uh, with the uh, Russia and Ukraine um, uh, war. So um, one thing that is important to understand is that before the war, before the Russian invaded Ukraine, the energy industry had been going for a, through a very strong transformation which is a structural transformation. And that structural transformation is driven 
not by the war, but by actually a bigger war, which is the issue about how the world is reacting and is suffering climate change. And climate change is from the point of view of two types of risks. One is from the point of view of physical risk, which is very relevant today because we are seeing some of that in what's going on in Puerto Rico with Hurricane Fiona. You probably have read that the whole island is in a blackout. Um, so, and the second thing is on the transition risk, which refers about how governments and individuals are reacting to climate change, how they are changing their behaviors and uh, their preferences. And that is uh, something that the energy industry needs to react to and it's, it's, it's actually transforming themselves so that they can actually you know, thrive in that environment. Because one thing that is important to understand about the energy sector is that the energy commodities that we use actually run through what we call high reliability networks. Like think about the energy grid, think about the pipeline that move the gas. Those are networks that are actually supporting um, critical lifeline infrastructure, where a failure in one of those networks will have this cascading effect, which we saw some of that uh, during the recent, not, not too long ago, uh, winter storm that happened actually in, in Texas, where there was a lot, where there were some loss of life because uh, you know the, the networks failed. So, um, how the industry is transforming to, to that, and again, how this train is going. So, in one way, the industry is, is doing transformations to become more resilient. When, when resilient is defined from the point of view of the ability that the energy industry has to, and the energy system have to resist, absorb and accommodate to this climate driven uh, crisis and shocks. Now think of uh, how the industry accommodated to winter storms, think also of um, how the industry has responded to hurricanes, even how the industry responded to, co to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So in order to do that, um, the industry is actually changing uh, some of the way in which uh, operates. Like uh, for many for many years, the way has always been to optimize, like the electric grid, which is the typical example, to to function as a very centralized network, very complex. And now it's kind of evolving to the concept of having more decentralized grids. So if something fails uh, in one of in one transmission line or in one pipeline, the whole thing, the whole network is not going to collapse. And that's one of the things, lessons, for instance, that was learned about um, Puerto Rico, for instance. The second thing is that um, for a long time, the issue of codes and standards in, in the industry has been more about a consensus, no? like, okay, we all agree about, you know, what codes and standards we should implement. But there have been this additional discussion now that now the codes and standards should not be so much to be more about uh, getting to a level where actually respond to climate change as many of the variables that define the codes or how things are built uh, depend on weather forecasts based on history where that history of the, of the historical weather data might not be relevant that, uh, given that the, the, the weather is changing so much. Uh, also changes in regulatory markets uh, up to now uh, for you know uh, the concept of uh, you know how to pay for energy is, is you know you, you pay for the electricity and you're always assuming that the electricity is there for you 24 7. So recent recent crises have have uh, brought up to the issue about the opportunity to open what is called resilience as a service. So you paying for res paying for resilience, to someone that's guaranteed to you that no matter what happened, you will get power 24 seven. Very important, for instance, if you own a grocery store, right? Uh, and one other, another thing that has uh, important geopolitical implications uh, is the issue about increasing regional, regional interconnections. How to make sure that you are connected in such a way that if one connection fails, you still can pull power from other connection. That was actually pretty relevant 
uh, in the recent uh, crisis in ERCOT, Texas, whereas the grid failed uh, due to a lack of inter interconnection that the state had with other uh, US um, regions, uh, the amount of power that they could bring during the crisis was very limited. So uh, the world is actually moving into that and there are very big initiatives out, out, uh, out there. Uh, some of them uh, that go across continents like the famous uh, global electric interconnection that is being pushed by China. And uh, also there are some regional ones like, uh, like one that is being pushed by the Gulf states. So that will increase resilience. At the same time, uh, the industry is also changing to be more sustainable. So you, um, as we discussed here, the increases in the presence of oil, uh, you probably have, uh, you know, could, could see that, um, you know, the industry has been reducing the, the investments on fossil fuels for a long time. Uh, co uh, electric companies that had a lot of uh, coal power plants have decided to divest some of those uh, plants and actually invest more in renewables. At the same time, um, the, there has been a significant change on how the energy is used. Now there is a big push about the adoption of electric vehicles and how they, you know, how having all these mobile loads are going to change um, uh, the way in which the grid operates. In general, uh, a movement to sustainability is a movement that goes hand in hand with the customer and where the idea is that in the future of the energy system, you know, the customer will be more proactive and it will be able to um, take advantage of, of some of these uh, 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 technological change of a smart grid and things like that to be able to actually uh, generate the energy themselves, use electric vehicles to generate energy, provide services. So what we call um, potentially that the future of utilities it's going to be to become like Airbnbs, like the Airbnb of the energy system. So all that, all those trends existed before the crisis that we are going through. But what are those trends are going to? I don't think that those trends are going to be stopped because of what's going on in the war in Ukraine. It is true that the war in Ukraine has highlighted some of the uh, transition pains that the industry needs to ad adapt to. Uh, in Europe, especially, that is obvious with the concept of energy uh, security. The uh, uh, energy security that has also brought up further the, that the problem of intermittency of some of the renewable energy, like solar or wind, has not been resolved. So still, um, the uh, level of technology on, on storage is not yet there to make sure that yeah, the issue of intermittency on wind and solar is resolved. Um, at the same time, as you know, or you have read, the, um, the issue of cybersecurity risks and whether or not um, a, something like the electric network, where everything depends on, can be actually knocked down by hackers and by uh, uh, you know, other states is something that uh, is, has been um, a, emphasized, especially given the circumstances. And one more important thing that actually I would like to also mention here in my, in my time is that the energy, the crisis has also uh, emphasized the connection between energy as a commodity and actually uh, food security. You know? As uh, some of the energy, um, the, the natural gas is, being, is used for the fertilizers. But I'm very optimistic that actually this shock, like previous shocks that have happened in the energy complex, I think, let's think about the oil shocks in the 70s. What this is going to do is actually it's going to be a source of innovation. Uh, this uh, transition pain will open the door for uh, new things, new ideas. And some of these ideas we are seeing that today, like um, having better batteries or like, for instance, they are, mini, mini, they are having uh, mini nuclear power plants and having um, many innovations like the one I mentioned about the Airbnb of uh, having utilities operating as an Airbnb. So those things, those transitions actually would accelerate um, the, uh, the uh, transformation that the industry is having. So I'm very optimistic on that. Now, at what speed all that is gonna be done? Um, it depends on 
on the, the particular uh, uh, situation of the region, like the United States is a exporter of energy. Uh, other countries are net importers of energy. So that would change, but I think that, I think that definitely the um, trends will continue and the, um, the uh, energy system will become more resilient and more sustainable because climate change, climate change is a reality. With, with this, I end my, my, my presentation, Natalie. Okay. I'm trying to turn, turn on my camera. Thank you very much. My original intention to, was to begin with Russia, but I would like perhaps to change it a little bit and begin by showing uh, European energy dependency. With this, I will look just a second at this slide. If you can see the slide, it shows uh, European energy dependency in total. Those are European countries. In yellow, the year 2000. In blue, the year 2020. As you can see, many European countries are almost 100% dependent on energy, they import energy. If you look at selected kinds of energy, this is a European dependency on solid fossil fuel from 100% to significantly lower for different countries like Belgium, Italy, France, and so on. If we look at natural gas, it is shocking to see that almost many European countries, almost all of them are highly dependent on imported energy. And over the years, this dependency has not changed significantly. And finally, oil. The same picture, you see very significant dependency on oil for many, many countries. And that creates a very interesting environment under which I will be uh, dropping this slide and reconnecting with my PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> my presentation essentially begins with the map of Russia. It is the largest uh, land on Earth. Uh, it stretches 11 zones, time zones. On the left hand side from this yellow, it is a European part of Russia. On the right hand side, it is the Asian part of Russia. European part of Russia is significantly more developed and Asian part of Russia is less developed, sparsely populated but it has most uh, mineral riches, which Russia take advantage of. I also put together two quotes uh, illustrating Russian national character. Russia is never as strong as she appears and never as weak as she appears. Another quote is by Winston Churchill, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside enigma. Uh, this slide shows the global role of Russia under the USSR. It used to be the former superpower. After the demise of the USSR, Russia became once smaller as a population, but they make an effort to reemerge as a global player and military player. 
Historically speaking, this discussion is important because uh, depending on who you talk, uh, different sources uh, claim different statehood. According to my estimate, uh, Russia was established in ninth century uh, as a Kievan Rus. Uh, through multiple centuries, Russia became uh, subject of partitioning and change by uh, Vikings, by Tatars and Mongols. In the late uh, 19th century, Russia engaged in the devastating First World War, which ended up in the revolution, and eventually the humble attempt to establish democracy in Russia ended up in the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Short history of Russia under the USSR, civil war, new economic policy, where it was an attempt to use capitalism to fix socialism, establishment of the USSR, including Russia, Transcaucasian republics, Ukraine and Belarus, then Stalin, five-year plan, uh, military coup d'etat in 1991 that ended the Soviet Union and led to the deposition of Mikhail Gorbachev, who recently passed away. Russia goes through financial crisis almost every 10 or 15 years. And uh, after Putin was picked up by Yeltsin in 2000, he has been in power for 22 years with some uh, minor changes. This is a summary from my relatively recent uh, journal publication on Russia, where I make an argument that Russia is not interested in internationalization, unlike other European countries. And those arguments are grounded in Russian geostrategic location, relative isolation, harsh climate, uh, strong statesmanship, authoritarian tradition, and so on and so forth. This is an interesting cultural slide comparing and contrasting Russia and the United States as uh, national cultures. As you can see, Russia is in blue, is almost diametrically different from the United States. Although we have some similarities in population and geography, but culturally speaking, the countries are very different. Some statistics about Russian macroeconomics, as you can see, uh, real GDP growth uh, was positive in previous year, dropped to minus 6.2%. It will continue being negative, and after several years, it will reemerge on the positive side. Significant level of inflation, negative government balance, uh, positive current account balance, meaning that exports exceed imports, relatively low unemployment rate, and relatively unfavorable uh, foreign currency exchange rate. This is a chart showing Russia compared to other countries in terms of gross domestic product per capita. As you can see, Russia loses to some uh, Central and Eastern European countries, but ahead of some other countries in the former Soviet Union. Uh, this chart shows uh, negative trends in real GDP growth compared to the world and East Central Europe and relatively high consumer price inflation, which is a worrisome for the current government. <clears throat> Some energy statistics in Russia, it is a global energy major, number one in proven gas reserves, second largest coal reserve, eighth largest oil reserves, major exporter. So all those things make Russia extremely strong as a global energy player. And it also gives the nation a leverage over some countries. This chart shows the difference between energy production and energy consumption. As you can see, for different types of energy, Russia has significant surplus 
which they export. These are the energy experts uh, in terms of consumption, uh, for the most part by natural gas and petroleum, and relatively insignificant part is supported by hydro and renewable. Power generation by source, again, for the most part, powered by fossil fuels, nuclear power, and relatively insignificant by renewable. This chart shows production and consumption of petroleum and other liquids. Again, you see the difference between production and domestic consumption, which allows Russia to export significant amount of oil. Uh, gas reserves, the largest in the world, followed by Iran, Qatar, United States, and Turkmenistan. Dry natural gas production and consumption, again, showing uh, surplus that Russia exports. Russia is a major culprit in flaring natural gas, followed by Iraq, Iran, United States, which is not good for the environment. With your permission, I will skip certain slides showing how Russia exports by destination. In a sense, it shows that uh, all major markets for Russia are European countries, to some extent Asia and non-OECD countries. This is the last part of my presentation dealing with cross-country comparison between Ukraine and Russia. As you can see, Russia is much larger. It has more developed art forces, uh, higher GDP per capita, stronger military. Some historical highlights uh, illustrating Ukrainian statehood, difficult history. The nation was under different control and jurisdiction in different economic times, including Poland, Lithuania, Austrian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Lately, uh, Ukraine was bullied by Russia and Russia took Crimea in 2014 and later uh, Russia invaded Ukraine on a full-scale uh, war. What drives war in Ukraine? There are some historical factors and disputed claims about statehood and origin. Diverging political economic gravitations, Ukraine wants to be a part of Europe, Russia wants to be independent and is not interested in joining Europe. Plus, it has something to do with Vladimir Putin's personality, his humble origin, Napoleon syndrome, and current uh, pattern of authoritarian regime in Russia. This is the latest map of Ukraine showing that Russia took significant parts of Ukrainian territory and current battle is waging around south in the city of Kherson and around two enclaves, the uh, Donetsk Republic and Luhansk Republic, which are mostly unrecognized as official uh, Russian territories. Uh, Russia makes an effort to set up a referendum to legitimize this uh, claim, but recently, Ukraine made significant progress in uh, the military operation against Russia. This is the latest statistics about war. And uh, statistically speaking, according to different sources, uh, Russian troops lost about 50,000 people. Ukrainian losses are not known according to different sources. Uh, according to recent assessments, uh, the war may be over sooner or later. Uh, some sources say it may be months, some sources say it may be years. 
Uh, with your permission, I will stop my presentation here and give the podium to Robert Kep to cover some Asian impl implications and possibly we can shorten it a little bit to open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Anatoly. That was fascinating. I always learned so much from you, especially when it comes to a country like Russia and, and now with the conflict that it initiated in Ukraine, understanding more of that historical uh, background, I think is very important. Uh, let me just uh, share my slides here. I will keep it brief so we can uh, move to Q&A. Let me just um, get that on full screen. Okay. So I'm looking at things in terms of implications for Asia. And also how Asia is uh, influencing the war, I think is quite interesting, uh, or at least uh, not so much influencing the war as at least influencing uh, Russia's ability to conduct it. So real quickly, uh, just a few slides here, I'll just uh, keep it to highlights. But if you look at the global energy sector in terms of what's happened uh, since uh, February, March, uh, that is February over March uh, period, uh, which is when of course Russia invaded Ukraine, compared to the latest uh, recorded uh, two-month period, uh, July to August, uh, you can see uh, those who are importing more from Russia, right, uh, it stand out uh, as India and China. They're, they're the two leading importers of uh, Russian commodities. You can see here, it's like Anatoly showed us a whole variety of uh, commodities that, that Russia exports. So uh, this is mainly uh, in the area of uh, coal and, and, and things like oil and so forth. Uh, at least in terms of uh, the, the Europe uh, receipt. And in fact, the colors have somewhat changed. I'm sorry because of my overlay with, with greens and red. But anyway, you can see that uh, it's India and China are, are the standout net e expansionist uh, importers uh, of energy from Russia. Whereas uh, it's interesting that, that compares the rest of the world, which has gone in the opposite direction, led by the EU, of course, uh, Germany standing out. Uh, there's a sense that Germany might buckle under this, but they've held uh, true. Uh, so has the EU. You see also in Asia, I've highlighted Japan and South Korea notably have also uh, gone negative with, with imports. So they've reduced their, their uh, imports. So what you have is basically uh, India has been long dependent on Russia for weapons. Uh, that's why it's, a, you know, the assumption is that that's the rationale for it continuing to import uh, oil from Russia. It, it wants to support its uh, most reliable arms provider. It also has some geopolitical uh, machinations in mind vis-a-vis um, -vis Pakistan and also being a, a long-term uh, so socialist uh, country, uh, even though it's moved to a capitalist model. So the real interesting geopolitical dimension of that, of course, is what's called the Quad. The Quad is where you have kind of, you know, urgently uh, promoted by the United States. It's the US, Japan, Australia, and India. That's known as the Quad. And it's, it's this it counterbalance to Chinese expansionism, military expansionism. So it's kind of interesting where, where India is buckling with the trends of these other allied powers, as it were, and it's actually the leading uh, net importer right now of uh, energy from Russia. So that, that's one side of this equation. The other side is China, of course, China is the most important partner for, for Russia across a whole spectrum of uh, areas. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's now overtaken uh, Germany as the largest importer of Russian fuels, not, not coal, but, but fuels. Um, it, it's also uh, taken up in terms of the Pacific area, right? So basically East Asia, it's already taken everything Russia can provide. So, you know, it, it, there's no more Russia could give it, even if China wanted to help it out more. And one of the other interesting components to all this, of course, is there was this concern when in February, uh, China and Russia, around the time of the Beijing Olympics, announced this uh, partnership, you know, this friendship that no, no new, that would no new, no, <laughs> no, no bounds, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's a, it's a repetitive uh, expression, but no, no bounds, right? There would be, there would be no limitations to this partnership. And that, that looked very ominous. And then, in fact, China has been rather reticent to do anything other than buy things from Russia. So that's really the extent of its support right now. What's particularly interesting is just last week, what, there was the Shanghai Cooperation Organization held in Uzbekistan. And uh, this uh, is where you really saw how things are looking for Russia with these partnerships. So uh, Chinese uh, Chairman Xi Jinping 
uh, flat out told Putin he's concerned. So he's gone from being best friends in February to saying there are real concerns about the war for China, which means a lot to, to Putin because China is its number one economic, uh, political, and military ally. Uh, India also, more bluntly, uh, Narendra Modi, the uh, prime minister of India, told Putin flat out, today's era is not an era of war. And I love the response from Putin to Modi. This is uh, in the press quoted, we will do our best to stop this as soon as possible, and even acknowledging concerns that you constantly express. I mean, it almost sounds like he's, you know, conceding. You're, you keep nagging me about this, and and okay, we'll 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 stop this. So, be interesting to see if if India and China are are the real causes brought to bear to force Putin's hand, in addition to all these setbacks that have been going on. Okay, and then um, just real quickly on this slide to note that uh, if you look at the what's happened with status quo power balances in in energy. Uh, you've got your major uh, hydrocarbon fuel exporters, right? Middle East and Russia is still the same. The U.S. through shale innovation and and gas, uh, natural gas, has has now gone from being a major importer to being self sufficient. So that's changed things. And Asia, led by China, with all the growth going on in the region, has now emerged as the major importer of energy. So in the 21st century, as we've you know, moved into this century, energy security has moved as primarily an Asian priority, right? Where it used to be more a U.S. priority. We saw that with the OPEC oil embargo in the 70s. It's now something that Asia is most concerned about. Um, and I, I thought I had one more slide here. Uh, let's see. Uh, if not... I guess I'm good anyway, but, oh, there we go, sorry. Just real quickly, wanted to point out, if you look at the Chinese uh, tally, and this is one of the reasons there's so much pressure coming to uh, Putin uh, about this, is, so China's quick gains from the uh, war, as it were, just looking at this geopolitically, ignoring the human tragedy going on, yes, it, it's shown solidarity with Russia for what that's worth. It, it's got now leverage with Russia, and it's able to satisfy its current energy needs. But um, what it's lost is it's totally alienated the EU. It just tried very hard to negotiate a treaty of trade that it had been working on for years that had been agreed to before the election of Joe Biden. And now that's totally off the table for the EU, as long as there's the war in Ukraine. Its global credibility is suffering tremendously. The economy is slowing. That's not only owing to the geopolitical tensions from the war, but it, it doesn't make it better uh, for China. And it certainly doesn't uh, help Russia that China's economy is slowing because it, it decreases the demand for fuel. And moreover, what's really interesting is the strength of the Ukrainian resistance is inspiring Taiwan, Beijing's number one objective in the geopolitical realm. So defense of Ukraine has been strengthening U.S.-Taiwan ties. It's reinvigorated anti-China sentiment in Taiwan. And now Taiwan's learned really interesting strategies for defeating a big, powerful neighbor from Ukraine. I think that's the biggest loss for China right there. And I'll end my slides with that. Um, so thank you very much. Stop share. There we go. If I may take over as a panelist, I'm trying to put my... Oops, for some reason, it's slow. We have a question. How is a change over in the gasoline market from summer to winter gasoline in California going to affect the product balance as well as the price of gasoline in the West Coast and in the United States due to the supply challenging due to the Russian market? Uh, Ismail, you want to answer this question? Can you repeat the question? I couldn't. Uh... How is the change over in the gasoline market from summer to winter gasoline in California going to affect the product balance as well as the price of gasoline in the West Coast and in the United States at large? due to the supply challenges in the Russian market? Yeah, I mean, uh, as uh, Rob was saying, um, you know, the, the U.S. has been affected, but, you know, the, the impact has been relatively small. In fact, if anything, the oil price has been coming down recently. So 
I, I think that my view is that the impact of the Russian uh, war on the oil prices uh, has been largely mitigated, and I don't expect um, the uh, the impact to uh, to be maintained. So, I mean, that's one of the great things about uh, Fortress America during this in this situation. Um, so, and uh, so I think that the, you know definitely the U.S. has the um, mechanisms to be able to smooth out whatever impact would be from from from, um, from the Russian crisis. That, that's my view. I would also add that America is not highly dependent on Russian oil supply. It mostly deals okay. with local oil suppliers, and we are somewhat. Uh, yeah, we put very little. In fact, mm -hmm. in fact, the the fact that we have a, a now a, a ban on Russian oil is that is not that we were right. we use it that much to start with. So. If I may, I would like to ask Robert. Uh, on his view of China as a major player in energy consumption and strategic rival to the United States. Do you think Russian war can in any way change China? Does China need Russia as a strategic partner except for energy? Well, the yeah, simple answer is yes, but it, it's a complex relationship. I think, you know, um, there's this curious personal affinity between Chairman Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin. And yet, I think geostrategically, if you look at the Kremlin and you look at Beijing and the, the ruling Communist Party, they deeply distrust each other. You know, uh, the former Soviet Union and China, once Stalin died, they, they had this massive split in the communist world. The closest we've come to nuclear conflagration was uh, where the Soviet Union was prepared to strike against uh, Chinese forces in its um, Western borders, uh, also in the 70s. And it was actually, curiously enough, the US that intervened. So it basically, it's a funny situation where China is very happy to take advantage of for example, this pipeline that's been constructed as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and it looks like, as the Chinese are want to say, a win-win, where a kind of joke I heard from a EU diplomat one time is win-win means I win twice from the Chinese side. But anyway, it's supposed to be helpful for Russia, helpful for China, this, this gas pipeline. But uh, in fact, China, if you look at its total energy strategy, it's and this is something it actually deserves a lot of credit for, it's pushing EV. Yes, it, it continues, especially with the current drought conditions. It's gone away from hydro to coal uh, generation. It's importing the fuels from Russia, much against the uh, global norm. But China's long-term strategy is a kind of energy independence through uh, renewable uh, and electric vehicles and so forth. So uh, it's an outlier in many ways. I, it, again, to just sum up the, the question you're, you're asking there, Anatoly, I don't think I don't think China has any more interest in Russia than using it to China's benefit, and and seeing it as a much more uh, complementary partner than almost any other country because they're both aligned against Western interest. And I imagine a sentiment is shared in Russia, but it's a very curious uh, kind of global partnership they have. Uh, Anatoly, if I could say something, is that um, China also understand that the trend. In responding to climate change is a structural trend, and mm. they have uh, it's not that because uh, uh, gas is cheap from Russia they're going to change their energy construct. In fact, uh, China has uh, significant technological uh, advantages in some critical uh, renewable technologies. That, mm. if anything, they want to expand those. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. This is just, uh, uh, you know, it's it from the perspective uh, of China, this is just um, uh, opportunistic relationship and more than more than a strategic relationship, it really, from an energy perspective. If I may bring a little bit of a controversy, <clears throat> according to my limited knowledge of the solar panel industry, and recently I conducted a comparative study of solar panel between California hmm. and Southern Europe, I know that about 90% of the global solar, solar panel manufacturing is done in China. 
in a sense, China yeah. became a monopoly, and yet we claim the energy transition from fossils to solar panel. Do you foresee any challenge in fulfilling our mission in this transition, or we will remain dependent on China as a major almost monopoly now? Is that question to Ismail or myself? Maybe I'll let Ismail uh, answer first, and I can chime you're in. Expert. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, my, view on that, my view on that is simply that, um, well, I mean, one thing that, that we need to re recognize the way in which China innovate. Innovate, China is a, is a magical innovator. So some of the breakthroughs in solar technology actually happened here in the US. It's just China got much better in scaling up in economies of scale. And therefore, you know, they have been doing marginal improvement, of course, by no, no, no doubt. So they, I mean, I could imagine that they would go better and better on, on the solar on solar uh, uh, technologies. However, that nobody said that solar is the latest and greatest from the point of view of the, of the uh, energy revolution. So there are many things where uh, the United, United States might actually leapfrog uh, China's um, uh, uh, advances because uh, we are better in breakthrough innovation than China is. But again, giving them credit for what they have done, which is still pretty um, significant. Just so, I, I think Ismail made great points. I just add, you know, th th there is actually this trade war going on with solar panels, uh, led actually more by the EU, which, which among the West kind of led, and Ismail can correct me if I uh, deviate from, from uh, what the consensus view is. But as I understand it, you know, the EU really led in terms of pushing like with Germany and, and, and other countries, they provided subsidies and ahead of the, the United States, of course, California has been a leader with that. But anyway, they, they, they really were moving forward with uh, integrating solar energy to their electric grids. And then as they were doing that, and also the US led by California was coming on board. Indeed, just as you described Anatoly, China assumed this monopoly position uh, largely against WT regulations, WTO, sorry, WTO regulations, because they were heavily subsidizing uh, the, this process. At the same time, I mean, it, it's not, you know, government subsidies and, and renewable energy are actually considered standard, but, but China was not only subsidizing the electric grids, they were subsidizing the manufacturing that created trade fictions. Anyway, I think it is interesting what Ismail pointed out, and that is, Technology is still in favor of the U.S. and uh, Europe, for that matter, but but especially I think the U.S. And also the trend now is towards decoupling. I don't think China's also had a, a huge monopoly in rare earths, and that's easily enough replaced. California used to be a leader in rare earths. California, Nevada, and Colorado can easily match uh, China's rare earth uh, output. We just haven't been doing it because it's extremely polluting. But the capacity is there, and, and we've developed new technologies to extract those rares more, more carefully. By the way, rares are very critical for electronics and especially EVs and, and the like. So anyway, I, I think it's going to be an interesting back and forth. China is in a strong position now. I wonder how long that will last. I, I don't think it will be as strong as it is, and it may actually turn into a weakness as more and more countries respond to China's behavior and think we have to have trade as well as energy security vis-a-vis -vis China, and, and they make sure China doesn't have that kind of monopolistic uh, power. I would like to bring another controversy. Several years ago, a major European country, Spain, decided to embark on solar panel monopoly, invested tremendous amount of money, subsidies, government support. And after some time, they discovered that China is a major manufacturer and the whole country went bust. I would like to bring into consideration the cost component. My understanding is that solar panel is important in environmental context, but how does it compare in terms of the cost on a per kilowatt basis with conventional energy? Uh, Ismail, if you have this information, it would be interesting to hear. Yeah, uh, what, what, I, I mean, one thing, uh, yeah, definitely uh, uh, the drop in some of the cost of production, uh, solar solar uh, uh, energy is competitive, competitive with some of the fossil fuel uh, technologies in such a way that um, that's something that didn't happen like three years ago, no? that when the subsidies were required to make sure to, to make the uh, solar energy, solar kilowatt hours, uh, cost of production competitive, but 
one thing I would like to put it out there also is that uh, solar energy is an intermittent energy, right? So it's, you know, they produce when the sun is out. And um, it, one important problem that has yet not been fully figured out yet is the issue about how to resolve that, that intermittency with storage, storage batteries, et cetera. They have improved that, but they are, they are not yet there. So one of the, one of the uh, there's a hidden cost of relying so much on renewable energy because you, you need to make, you need to have uh, what is called base load energy available. And that's what, for instance, in California, they had decided to extend the life of the nuclear power plants. Um, it, so if you, if you don't resolve the problem of intermittency, you still would gonna need to have some kind of coal power plant or nuclear power plant or something like that, that will provide you the 24 hour, um, the, you know, the base load and that co is costly. And that is a cost that, um, not necessarily, it's not baked in when you try to compare uh, the uh, the solar against um, uh, other fossil te technologies, but maybe that's an issue that has been raised as a result, especially in Europe, as a result of this war. Do we still have a couple of minutes for another question, Jansen? Uh, sure, we do have the time, so we can go until like 6.10 or 6.15, and then we have a few questions in the Q&A box, as you see there. So you can entertain those uh, three questions. Okay, the question is from Gabriela, when the Russian-Ukrainian conflict settles, will the EU resume previous trade deals with Russia, or it will take a while? For the diplomatic climate to clear? If so, how long? <clears throat> I would like to field this question. Uh, there is a great degree of unpredictability and according to my latest uh, information, there are some turbulent discussions in the Russian top uh, leadership and depending on how those discussions materialize, we may see some change in the Russian leadership and depending on this, we may have a new Russia. We may have a new Russia. How long and uh, what it will be, I do not know, but there are some scenarios. Uh, those scenarios include military defeat of Russia, uh, huge reparations, and perhaps even fractured Russia. Some hmm. territories of Russia gravitate towards Asia, some part gravitate toward Europe. So it remains to be seen. I would suggest that it is very difficult to predict, but there are some uh, very bold, dire scenarios. Uh, next question, how will the shutdown of nuclear energy facilities in the east of Ukraine affect the price and stability of electricity in neighboring countries such as Poland and Belarus? that import some of the electricity from country of Ukraine. Uh, Ismail, you, you have an expertise to answer this question? I just, I would like to say on that, uh, is that I'm not sure if, uh, how many people are aware of, yeah, that they, uh, when, they, when the war started, uh, Ukraine was in the process of joining the European grid. And that was a process that was supposed to last two years. They, it was accomplished in two months. So uh, pretty fast, uh, you know, kind of like uh, a little bit um, uh, faster than, you know. So the, the, the challenge with that is that uh, it, it remains to be seen what are the implications of such a quick connection with the electric grid. Because for anyone that has been living the left through the blackout that happened in the Northeast, uh, Blackouts have these cascading effects, and um, you you never know if, for instance, a blackout that starts in Ukraine for some X Y Z reason, maybe the war, maybe something else, might actually end up creating a massive blackout in in, in, in significant parts of Eastern Europe, just because the way this interconnection was done. I mean, these are highly complicated uh, uh, processes that are supposed to take two years because it's complicated, but it was achieved in two months due due to the um, uh, pressing concerns of Ukraine being completely islanded 
as a result of the war. So that is one thing that is, remains to be seen and it's, it's one of the issues of concerns. Now on the nuclear power plants, uh, we, we read a lot about Saporilla and all these kind of things. I mean, one thing I have to say is that many of the um, nuclear power plants have designed to, to withstand major, major events, um, at least in the United States. And, and I, um, you know, uh, uh, they are more resilient than we give them credit for. So if anything, my biggest concern might be a, um, a blackout that might, might extend to, um, to Europe just because the way in which the connection was done only in two months. I would like to add a couple of points about the possibility of a, of a nuclear strike on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. According to my unofficial information, there have been some communication between American military leadership and Russian political leadership. And it was firmly stated that if there is any attempt to use nuclear strike against Zaporizhia, there will be severe consequences of equal mm. nature. We mm. do not know how and want, so I personally do not expect any trouble from Zaporizhia. I would also like to comment on Poland and Belarus. <clears throat> Poland is 63% dependent on imported gas, but a uh, good point is that they are close to Baltic countries who managed to build liquefied gas terminals recently. And in case of Russian blockade and trouble, I think Poland should be in a relatively good shape. Another part of the puzzle is that uh, they have some interconnectors in the electricity supply and they can redirect power from different countries. So it will likely to mitigate. About Belarus, uh, I think it's a relatively small country oscillating between West and East and the current president, Mr. Lukashenko has been so skillful in his political survival for over 20 years. I think in case of trouble, he will switch to the West. In case of trouble from the West, he'll switch to the East. I don't see any potential problem with uh, Belarus. Mm. It's a relatively small country. You can go ahead on the last question. One more question, Anatoly. Yeah. May I ask my own question? And I would like to ask uh, Robert. I was educated back in the USSR and I did not realize that Russia took some Chinese land during the 19th century, during the Opium Wars. And now when Russia became weakened, also there is a technical agreement between China and Russia on the status quo. Do you foresee any time when weakened Russia will be again taken over by Chinese and Chinese mm -hmm. land will be returned back to China, creating a new reality in the region. Well, if I understand correctly, Russia has already felt threatened by Chinese commerce in the sense of there was a, a kind of Chinatown emerging outside of Moscow, and that was then destroyed a few years ago. And I think you see that. You see that along you know, the, the border, uh, Heilongjiang and, and Siberia where Chinese traders have come over and, and they're, they're prospering. And it's, um, uh, by the way, it's not, it's not un, unlike, I mean, we, we have to sign and separate out uh, Chinese cultural norms, which really support an entrepreneurial spirit. And, and, and you have these massively successful traders th throughout centuries of history. And so also in Southeast Asia, you see this, but then local populations who don't have those merchant skills often grow resentful. I've heard of that uh, taking place, like in Siberia, there's a lot of resentment for the, the, the manifest Chinese wealth that's appearing in an otherwise poor area of Russia. But in terms of land, I mean, China is very land acquisitive, if anyone, and in fact, it's energy related, or, or that's one of the main factors. If you look at the South China Sea, um, you know, China has been doing this island building uh, it, it, against uh, claims by, in fact, UN recognized claims for the Philippines and Vietnam and Malaysia and so forth. So China is very sensitive to, to sovereign territory, but it just, um, not that it couldn't happen. And they've been very willing to try this with uh, India along the disported border with India. But unless like uh, your, some of your predictions indicate Anatoly, if, if Russia were to go pro-West, um, 
then maybe it would try that. But it, it just seems low on uh, the list of priorities. And it's already, every time it does this, it, it kind of gets itself into trouble. I mean, there, there's objections. So South China Sea is so strategically important to China, it seems very eager to claim territory there. With India, it's had to negotiate in, in a very unstable truce um, and back off of it. It has less strategic interest in acquiring Russian land, and it's not really threatened by Russia. But if, but if Russia were to go massive, if, if Russia were to become like Ukraine and, and be perceived by tr uh, China the way uh, Russia is currently perceiving Ukraine as an expansion, say, of NATO or something, then it could happen. But I think that's a very big hypothetical and, and fairly unlikely. One question was about the impact of Western sanctions on the Russian economy. My understanding is that there have been very significant impacts, including limitations on high-tech components for Russian civilian manufacturing and military production, uh, harsh economic things, and the worst is yet to come. I believe there is a very negative, strong impact, and it will get worse before it gets better. Mm. Uh, I would like to ask the audience if there are any other questions that we can address. Okay, so we have about five minutes uh, left. I'd like to actually follow up on the last question Anatoly, you answered. Uh, even though you said that there's a quite a negative impact, so the consequences, some people actually they believe that tough economic sanctions in Russia has not been working uh, due to the EU's, as you said in your own presentation, high dependence on Russian natural gas. So do you believe that this was a kind of loophole in otherwise very tough economic sanctions in Russia? Anyone can, you know, answer this question. I would like to bring a very important point. The original idea of the Russian war in Ukraine was to take Kiev in three days. Recently, because <laughs> of the military defeats, they shifted to a different tactics, and it is uh, take Europe by the throat through cold in three months. Uh, a lot will depend on how Europe can cope with the cold and uh, economic consequences of shortage of gas because it's also fertilizers, chemical industry, metallurgy, and eventual unemployment. The difference between Russia and Europe is that in Russia, you have a dictator that runs the country for more than 20 years and nothing changes. In Europe, those economic consequences may topple the government. And uh, it remains to be seen whether Europe can withstand it. Uh, Rob, if you do not mind, uh, I mean, you made a very interesting point in comparison between that um, uh, India and Russia. Yeah. So India is part of the four legs of the quad, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but uh, so actually, the U.S. government, I think, is hoping to get more support um, uh, from India, uh, given yeah. all this new sort of strategic relationship that we try to form with the country. Do you see that? As the war gets sort of longer and prostate, that we'll see more cooperation from India and, of course, that the relative to China. Yeah, I think, though, very reluctantly, it's strange. Uh, among those quad partners, India is by far the most reluctant. Uh, even Japan, which, you know, it, it's fascinating to me to, to look at our standoffs with uh, China vis-a-vis uh -huh. uh, -vis Japan 30, 40 years ago. Uh, Japan was seen as the great rival to, to the U.S. Not, not too long ago. And in fact, it also surpassed the U.S. in per capita GDP and was seen as, you know, Japan is number one, as Rebogel and Harvard came out with that. Uh, the founder of Stratfor actually argued quite persuasively at the time, at least to Japanese audiences, that there would be a war between Japan and the U.S. Uh, it, was, it was seen as inevitable based on maritime interests. But India is quite interesting because it would seem to be a no-brainer from a Western perspective that, of course, you, you're threatened by China. China supports your number one geopolitical rival, Pakistan, which you have fought a war with. You're at kind of a state of war, a bit like North and South Korea, a kind of, you know, unsettled peace there. Um, so in any case, 
India, it would seem to be much more on board with the Quad and, and US-led initiatives, but it, it constantly likes to show it, its independence in that regard and kind of go against the grain. However, to your questions, Yong Sun, I think it'll be more and more compelled. I mean, what, you know, again, those quotes between uh, Putin and Modi just, just a few days ago, uh, where, where basically Modi is kind of slapping Putin down in a very public way, very embarrassing way. Mm -hmm. And and who would want to partner with Russia, especially militarily? I can't imagine India war planners feeling very confident in their Russian-made equipment based on the performance, particularly of Russian tanks, um, which seem to be especially dismal in, in this fight. And the Air Force, I mean, you can't think of a single... The, the Russian flagship was sunk. OK, so so India's two major pillars of military strategy are its land force. It has the world's well, it used to have the world's largest standing army. That's now been replaced by China, but still this massive standing army okay. and its navy. And it's increasingly needing to upgrade its navy because of Chinese provocations from the Indian perspective. And yet, you know, the Russian flagship was sunk with U.S. technology and Ukrainian strategy. So I, I just think, although they don't want to, New Delhi, I think they, yes, will come more into this kind of Western fold very, very reluctantly, but because there's no one else they can play off against. Sure. Okay. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So thank you so much, Anatoly, for moderating this engaging and intriguing conversation with Rob and Ismail. Um, Rob and Ismail, uh, thank you so much for talking to LMU Community. Thank you. On your busy schedule. So we really appreciate sharing with uh, us your insights into this important and timely issue. Uh, your presentation was very informative and enlightening. Before we wrap up the webinar, I like um, actually that the, I like to ask you um, to participate in the brief survey, um, and I really appreciate it if you can complete it. So finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined this webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program today. We'll be back with uh, another exciting program uh, on cybersecurity uh, in October. I think the dates are already set. It's October 11th, uh, between 6.30 and 8 p.m. Um, so please stay safe and healthy until then. And uh, once again, thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.